sampling, and generalizability. For what purposes do you hear the word sample being used? Maybe your favorite musical artist released a new song that sampled the chorus of another song released earlier, remixing and adding filters here and there, but a sample nonetheless. Or maybe you go to a store and an employee is handing out free samples of their new product. Either way, sample is used to refer to a part of something else, a smaller and more manageable piece. Researchers use sampling strategies in a similar way because getting everyone to participate in your study is more likely than not impractical, if not impossible. It's like taking a whole song and claiming it as yours, which is plagiarism, or sneaking out the store with the whole free sample supply, which is just plain greedy. So, when you read studies, the method section typically opens with the characteristics of the participants of the study, and who the participants are have a great impact on what the study can say. A sample is a smaller group of people coming from the population. A sample is derived from a population. That is, the population is everyone who could possibly be included given your research problem. So, if you're doing a study on the hand-eye coordination of avid video game players, your population is everyone who plays video games. Or maybe you'd specify a video game or a range of ranks on the leaderboard just so your participants are comparable. But that's still too many people. So, you select a sample or a smaller set of people that you get from the population. We'll see in a while the many ways that you can sample from the larger population. It's very rare for a study to get everyone because, for most research questions, findings that derive from a smaller group can be assumed as insightful enough to represent everyone. However, in a census, you ask everyone what they think. This is the case for population statistics conducted every few years. This is a type of study that shouldn't miss anyone because census surveys have very real consequences on national, economic, political, and sociocultural planning. Other studies don't aim to have that much of an impact, so they're good with much less people. How we sample people from the population depends on what purposes our study serves. Sampling strategies fall into two general categories, and we'll look at the four most common types under each one. The first category contains the probability sampling strategies, called that way because everyone in the population has an equal and known chance to get into the sample. People are randomly selected, and so, in most cases, personal characteristics irrelevant and confounding to the study are downed out by the randomization. These types of sampling are preferred in quantitative studies because, as we will see later, probability samples tend to be representative such that findings we derive from their answers can be reasonably thought to reflect the response of everyone else had they participated too. The most common probability sampling strategy is called simple random sampling. The easiest way to do this is to put everyone's name on the piece of paper, put all the papers in the container, then shake the container. Pull out as many names as you need, and that's it. If you're high tech, let the computer go through a list of everyone in your population. Simple random sampling isn't very practical though because it's not often that you're allowed to have the names of everyone, data privacy act and all. Also, no one wants to print that many names and cut each one out to fulfill your fishable method fantasies. The next strategy, systematic sampling, works with a list of people as well. For example, you select a random positive integer, then get every nth person in that list. So, if you get 8, you scan the list to sample every eighth person, or when waiting for people to randomly survey on the street, ask every eighth person who has the misfortune of passing by you that day. People don't really like ambush interviews though, much more surveys. Cluster sampling works with pre-existing groups of people, with this grouping believed to be quite irrelevant to your research problem. In this strategy, you don't select random people, but random groups. So, if you have five groups and you get the number two, then everyone in the second group is your sample. But if that group still has too many people, then you can do multi-stage sampling. After randomly selecting a cluster, you then randomly select people from that cluster to get a more practical sample size. Stratified random sampling operates on a similar principle by sampling people based on categories, this time demographic characteristics, such as age, sex, religion, socioeconomic status, and educational attainment that can potentially influence our research outcomes. So. Unlike cluster sampling, social strata are meaningful and influential differences 
so we ensure that the final sample reflects the demographic distribution of the population. Let's make it clearer. In the Philippines, national survey organizations usually work with our archipelago's geographic bounds and administrative divisions to make stratified samples based on population size and location. To represent everyone, they typically get people from four major geographic areas, Metro Manila, Balance Luzon, or everyone outside the metro, Visayas, and Mindanao. Within those areas, you'd have regions, then provinces, districts, towns and cities, barangays, states, and finally, households. These organizations usually randomly select provinces as a whole cluster within the major areas, then randomly sample towns within them, then districts, towns, barangays, states, households, until they have surveyed enough people to meet the target sample size. So, they stratify based on location and population, then cluster based on smaller area divisions. This system is still random because everyone has an equal chance of getting included, but on the basis of their groupings, in our case, where they live. Sometimes, some social groups have a few members, but we think that the final sample would include too few members from them, such that our statistical estimates can be skewed. In that case, we can oversample or change the weighting in our sample size by inviting more people from those small groups, even if they will be overrepresented in the final sample. Note that what makes stratified random sampling, well, random, is that while demographic distributions determine how many people from a group is included, who gets sampled in the end is determined by any of the probability sampling methods we discussed earlier. So, in the Philippines, survey organizations doing studies on things related to religion may oversample outside the Roman Catholic majority or reach out to people outside the metropolitan areas, which could be different in terms of economic characteristics. Therefore, random sampling methods can actually be combined in many ways, depending on what would serve to improve the generalizability of a city's findings. When done well, a random sample is unbiased and includes representatives from everyone and everywhere, thus resulting in a study that can make claims of whatever type that speak for everyone, even those not included in the research. We can't make the same generalizations though when we use non-probability sampling methods. In these strategies, some people are left out on the sample systematically due to some characteristics they have. However, these methods are still useful in quantitative research, especially when psychologists reach out to people, particularly because they meet the needs of the study. The first method is convenient sampling, or simply who's there, whatever's most accessible. Psychologists are guilty of this. Psychology students who sign up for course credit, whoever passes in the hallway, how many people answer the online survey in the next week. These samples are not really representative of the general population because not everyone is a psychology student and neither do all of them pass by that specific hallway or have good enough internet access to answer the survey. People are then excluded based on geographic and demographic factors or self-selection, but some people are just more inclined to participate over others. Worse, these characteristics may have effects on our research that we now can't understand because we're not able to ask the people who we didn't reach. A related method, quota sampling, also has similarities to stratified sampling. The population is divided into meaningful groups, but the manner of sampling is non-random. You need 20 adolescent and 20 middle adulthood participants. Bribe your sibling, who is in high school, to take your survey to school and recruit 20 people. Convince your parents to do your surveying at their workplace. Done! But you fail to sample everyone who isn't your sibling's schoolmate or your parent's school lead. You might have represented age, but what about other intervening demographics? The next two strategies are more preferred in qualitative research because researchers set a clear reason for who they sample as informed by their research questions or goals. In purposive sampling, researchers contact people who meet specific criteria based on what their study needs. And in cases where the possible group of participants are small because of the strict sample criteria or sensitivity of a study's topic, Researchers can ask their current participants to snowball their study or refer them to other people who meet their criteria. So, if you're studying topics like experiences of survivors of COVID-19, you're likely to encounter a small and sparse sample, and not everyone who survived would be willing to be interviewed given the possible drastic consequences of the disease. What these strategies tell us is that larger samples are not necessarily more representative. Sample size contributes to generalizability only when the sampling method is unbiased. At the same time, findings from small and non-probability samples are not uninformative. 
Sometimes, your research question concerns a very niche group, so very few people would meet your criteria. For example, you'd find college students all over the world, but you have to look harder for college students to receive their degree after settling down, having a family, and ensuring all their children graduate first. In that case, your study would have more impact not by trying to generalize, but by going into greater depth into the uniqueness of this group's experiences, so you'd be better off reconsidering your research approach. Finally, non-representative does not automatically mean arbitrary. Purposive and snowball sampling strategies are useful depending on your research goals, allowing us to make non-generalizable yet insightful conclusions into the unique lives and out-of-the-ordinary experiences of individuals. The characteristics of our sample determine how well we can extend our findings to people outside the sample. We've been talking about representativeness as if it's a big thing. Because it is. When samples are representative of the population, we can generalize or extend our conclusions to those who are not part of our study, especially considering issues of social and cross-cultural differences. The entire reason why we sample in the first place is to know what everyone thinks without asking everyone. So, if your goal was to generalize and you didn't sample well, why sample at all? Generalizability manifests in two ways. External validity is our ability to generalize findings across people and even cultures beyond the groups and samples directly included in the study, and this is possible through random representative sampling. Meanwhile, ecological validity concerns our research design. It is about the generalizability of our findings to real-life settings across time and situations. Together, these two standards emphasize how our samples, depending on its size and demographic features, as well as our research design, to mundane near listen, our ability to mirror real-life situations in our potentially artificial research settings, can both determine what we can and can't conclude about human nature. In fact, these issues about generalizability have been haunting psychology for a long time, but we now have a better idea of what we're doing wrong. A good number of our most popular studies rely on unrepresentative samples. First, studies based on animal samples help us make inferences about our neural and brain functioning, hormonal communication, or genetic makeup. But we're reminded that differences in human and non-human physiology can render some findings only partially applicable. Next, many studies are based on primarily male samples. It turns out that a lot of medical and psychotherapeutic interventions were developed based on research with male participants, leading to their reduced effectiveness and even harm when applied to females. On top of that, we need to consider how much of psychological and social functioning are also tied to sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Third, if you look at psychological reports, college students get top billing for being the most studied subpopulation of the world. Because they're the most accessible and participate out of course requirements, college samples become the basis on which principles across psychological disciplines are typically built. The problem is that the experience of being in college isn't generalizable. These students tend to have developing attitudes, sense of self, and long-term relationships, have stronger cognitive skills, and are more likely to comply with research expectations, thus more likely supporting the study's hypothesis. Finally, Weird societies are the minority in the global population yet dominate psychological publications. This is despite the challenge issued by indigenous and cultural psychology to the universality of Western cognitive styles, values, and priorities, in addition to the possible inappropriateness of methodologies, constructs, and theories in non-weird or majority world societies. Unfortunately, journals themselves are not of the hook. While studies focusing on non-weird populations are dismissed as more appropriate for region-specific journals, research from the West are readily accepted as generalizable and published in the most widely circulated journals, despite their sample characteristics being held to more permissive reporting standards. Given these issues, it's clear why questions of external and ecological validity are crucial to be asked before accepting the results of a study as applicable to our own context. At the same time, Researchers, journal editors, and psychological organizations around the world are moving toward a more generalizable body of knowledge. Some journals have explicitly spoken about the need to clearly indicate how samples are selected and recognizing to whom their study can reasonably generalize. This is much in line with cultural psychology's challenge of contextualizing research findings in social and cultural forces. Also, 
researchers must be clear with regards to what they intend their study to accomplish. While research aimed at theory testing, which prioritizes internal validity, are still informative, more studies using experimental realism or simulations of daily settings and field research methods conducted in the real world apply well research theories and see how their predictions hold up in real life contexts. Thus, generalizability must be approached from both improving sample representativeness and design appropriateness. Samples are more practical to manage when doing studies, so we must be aware of how our strategies influence our outcomes. We look at the population sample relationship, what sampling strategies quantitative and qualitative researchers use in their studies, and how issues of external and ecological validity are at the center of research design. At the same time, we emphasize that when we do research, we look not only at the process of what we do, but also the people who help us while doing so. In the next lesson, we take this insight further by considering what standards we uphold to protect the interests of both, the ethics of participant welfare and scientific integrity. See you then!